Jean Calderwood, director of the Cambridge Art Association, and this is a creative process. This month, my guest is local artist Anne Forbush. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. So, Anne, um, you are a bookmaker and a printmaker. Yes. Um, you have your under undergraduate degree from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, and you just finished a graduate program at Mass Art. That's right. Correct. So, you kind of weave together bookmaking and printmaking. How did that happen? Well, my undergraduate degree um, is in photography, mm -hmm. and after I finished that degree, I really didn't have access to a darkroom, and I discovered printmaking. Mm -hmm. And once I started printmaking, I fell in love and never looked back. And then it's been a more organic uh, progression to making books. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of printmakers make books because it's a, it's a symbiotic <laughs> It's all made of paper. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I love process and I love texture. I have a background in textiles. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is a way that a lot of different processes can come together and a lot of disparate materials can come together. Interesting. Do you ever do photography at all? I know I've well, never seen any of your photographs. But. I do. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, since um, people have cell phones with such great cameras, I've started doing more. Yeah. Um, and in, in my graduate work, even, uh, mm -hmm. I did some photography that then became a book art. So, well, you have so a bunch of books yes. that you brought today. Yes. So, I brought a few examples. All right. So, where should we start? And if you want to talk about both sort of the process of the book and then the meaning behind it. With each one. Okay. And I can hold them up for you. Sure. This one is an early book, and it's um, it's a pretty simple form. It's a, an accordion, and it's made out of what was originally a single print. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I cut it in half and made it an elongated form, mm -hmm. it really changed the whole um, image and... I was able to then embellish it and add to it, so I added words and more textures and layers. Um, it's called Sunrise Moon Tranquility, mm -hmm. this one, that's what these characters mean. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always been an admirer of Asian form and art, and uh, so anyway, it was an early work and just mm -hmm. kind of learning the basics. Of book binding. Is it a monoprint or what kind of print is this? Yes, it is. And uh, a monoprint is essentially um, a print that you make by creating a painting on a smooth piece of uh, metal or glass, plexiglass, and printing it. So you, uh, they're one of a kind prints. You're not making um, a series or an edition like you would with traditional, more traditional forms of printmaking. Um, this is another type of book that I like to make. This was an this is an altered book. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you can see that they have glare on it, there but um, this one is called Two Admirals, which is the title of the book. And um, as you can see, I've carved cavities out of each half of the book. And how do you do that? 
How do you carve them out? I do it with a, a mat knife, carefully. <laughs> Just is it sort of one layer at a time? A couple or? of layers, yeah, yeah, a couple layers at a time. But um, I created this piece over here on the uh, on what I guess is the right hand side um, that looks like a, a corset, mm -hmm. which is cast paper with grommets and uh, woven um, flax and. Then the other side, obviously, is it's a moth wing that I collected on a trip. But I put this one together after recovering from breaking my back and being in a back brace and a corset for quite a long time. And mm -hmm. I liked the juxtaposition I between like being stitched back together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just I liked all the um, the different um, combinations of male, female, and natural and unnatural, mm -hmm. and something that is bound in something that's uh, not. <laughs> well, and also some of it's just the fragility of, I mean, the moth wing is such a fragile thing, and the fragility of nature, the fragility of your own body. Us, yes. Um, exactly. I didn't realize that that was paper. It looks like porcelain. No, it's cast paper. And there are it's impressions really in there of um, a spiral shell, which is an image that I've always been very attracted to and used in other work in prints. So Beautiful. anyway, that's just a piece that's particularly personal to me. I'm gonna sit that there. And so if you, if you were displaying that, say, in a gallery, would you put it on a pedestal or does it go on the wall? How does that work? It's a wall piece. A wall piece. And I do like making um, wall pieces because mm -hmm. I enjoy the sculptural aspects and just the intimacy of books. Mm -hmm. um, they're very tactile and they're something that you can, um, you can get in very close and, mm -hmm. and read the text and appreciate the the work that's gone into it by the hand of man or the hand of nature. Mm, so it's just beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. And this is another one. Okay. This one is called Once Once Upon a Cave Painting. Um, I've, like many artists, been fascinated by the cave paintings mm -hmm. um, for many years. And I've actually been to um, southern France a couple of times and visited numerous caves there. Um, Lascaux was closed a long time ago. That's what everyone knows. But um, there's Lascaux II, mm -hmm. which is a fabulous um, reproduction that if you didn't know it was a reproduction, you wouldn't know. It's inch for inch, every contour, every painting. And oh, and there's the Nautilus shells again. Exactly, yes, and compass rose. So this is a little bit like a treasure map. Oh, it's a visual. I feel like we just need to zoom out for this one. OK. There we go. It's a little bit like a treasure map. And um, the caves are very interesting because in some of them, the artists are really using the contours of the wall mm -hmm. um, and making that be the inspiration for the art that mm -hmm. follows, and other times not. Sometimes it's drawing charcoal, and sometimes it's drawing and redrawing so that it looks like the images are moving, mm -hmm. which is kind of wonderful. And um, other icons that reappear in my work up at the top. and. Mm -hmm. um, hand prints marking the spot yeah <laughs> that's that's my hand you can always tell when it has that crazy uh, uh -huh. that crazy curved pinky <laughs> so, yeah that's a thing it's a one of these uh -huh. genetic things yeah beautiful so it is literally made by your hand and they've got a wing there again so before we go to the your last piece and just talking a little bit more about your creative process so we've gotten to see a couple of your pieces Clearly the natural world figures into your work in a lot of ways. When you're out, you know, whether you're on vacation, you're out in your daily life, how do you record some of these things that are inspiring you? Well, I do take photographs mm -hmm. and I draw, but I like to work a lot from memory mm -hmm. also. Um, but also I feel like my work um, filters a lot of my own experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, as a child, I spent a lot of time going to the Gulf Coast. That's where we went to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. And so when the oil spill was happening several summers ago in the Gulf, that was deeply troubling to me. And I made a lot of books about that. Mm -hmm. um, so when different things are happening in my own life, I, I'm often using that as a source of, of inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, like the uh, two admirals with the, the corset mm -hmm. or um, other, other things that happen in, in my museum-going life mm -hmm. filter their way in or um, 
couple of years ago, the Marathon Bomber. Mm -hmm. that, that became something that worked its way in, in a subtle way. And it sort of uh, was combined then with um, having seen these frescoes that I saw in Spain. Mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of gotten to the soup. Interesting. I like that. The soup. It's like the creative soup exactly. of, of how it all muddles together and then sort of what comes out in the final product is very interesting because I think everyone, every artist has a different process of how it goes. And I had a meeting with a painter yesterday who is inspired by a lot of her travels, but she basically paints directly from photographs. And it's interesting to see, I mean, you're working basically in abstraction in a lot of ways. I mean, there's representative elements, but you're using symbols as opposed to, you know, being very explicit in what you're trying to represent. Definitely, and sometimes they evolve. Mm -hmm. Like this, um, I was saying that this had little icons that I sometimes mm -hmm. use. This is a, an image that has appeared in a lot of my prints over time. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's uh, like a kite. It defies gravity and floats. Mm -hmm. And other times it sort of seems like a corset that laces up. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's quite architectural with the window. Mm -hmm. And it depends on, on the context, what it means, or the placement mm -hmm. within the composition, what, is it what it means. You know, for you me, like I, I think here it's probably more like a window because mm -hmm. it sort of feels like I was thinking about caves and ice and light and mm -hmm. and treasure maps. Mm -hmm. and it's not always um, locked down and literal, but mm -hmm. um, it's in the hopper. Okay. <laughs> in the soup. I like it. There's a lot of room for interpretation. Um, Yes. With, with each of these pieces, um, which I feel like is something that is common with book art in particular, is that there are a lot of use of symbols and, and things, and it's finding your own meaning yes. in the work. A way to find a narrative, even if it's not an airtight narrative. Mm -hmm. Now, um, speaking of finding meaning, <laughs> yes. so your final piece, and I want to spend some time talking not just about this piece, but the larger series that it's part of is fascinating. So before we zoom in on it, if you want to talk a little bit about the rock <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had been working with stone and rock imagery. Um, I spent a lot of time in New Hampshire, the Granite mm -hmm. State, mm -hmm. and um, I, I love the organic beauty of stones and rocks. But um, I made a series of books using haiku poetry. Mm -hmm. I love words and, and narrative. And um, I decided that I was going to embrace chance to a much larger degree than usual. <laughs> a lot of printmakers say that they like to make mono prints because they can embrace happy accidents. I've heard that a lot. Yes. People say that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like I teach printmaking. Mm -hmm. And if you can keep the outside border clean, that anything that happens within the arena is fair game. Okay. So um, you're kind of embracing chance, mm -hmm. you know, and stuff happens when things go through the press that you mm -hmm. cannot necessarily control. Yes. Anyway, um, I have worked a lot with haiku poetry, which is very finely crafted because of the syllable count of mm -hmm. five, seven, and five. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I was going to create haiku poetry by chance. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote hundreds of phrases and literally put them into hats mm -hmm. and picked them out, fives and sevens, and created all these poems. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a technique that I know John Cage embraced chance and the surrealists and, mm -hmm. in, embraced chance in this way. Um, but the other thing was, um, in traditional poetry, you're only talking about nature in haiku poetry. Mm -hmm. And I also said, OK, I'm going to incorporate words that allow emotion and technology. Okay. And that changes the pallor very quickly. Okay. Why, why, those, why emotion and technology? Uh, because I felt it made it more current and relevant, and it wasn't just about, you know, the mist over the lily pads, mm -hmm. which, you know, a lot of haiku poetry, that's what it's about. Yes. <laughs> and so um, I created several volumes of books of these haiku by chance, and it's great because you read them and you want so much to have a narrative mm -hmm. that you just flow right with it. Wow. And I, several, so did you just sit down and write a bunch of phrases or was this a process over a number of months or weeks or how did, how did that process work? It was a number of months yeah. because um, what I did was 
whenever I was reading anything, mm -hmm. I would try to glean from it, or I'd hear something on the radio, you know, and I'd be writing it on the margin <laughs> on the, in the traffic yeah. um, because of the syllable count. Okay. And I also knew that if I were getting things from a novel and then things from an in-flight magazine mm -hmm. and things from the newspaper, Thank the diversity, yeah. exactly, <laughs> the diversity of the vocabulary would be much different than if you sit at home and say, okay, I'm going to just re rely on my haikus. <laughs> exactly. So that made it a lot broader. Okay. And um, yeah, it, it makes you uh, want to take the leap. You know, you've got the cadence taking you along mm -hmm. with the poem and then, um, yeah, we want to believe it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you had your volumes yes. of haiku parts. Yes. And then your reassembled random act haikus. Yes. And, and so, then what happened? Well, those, I decided I, I, I like putting the juxtapositions together. Mm -hmm. I had stone cut for the outside mm -hmm. and the parchment paper put inside for, mm -hmm. the, for the poetry. Mm -hmm. So those are... They're stone and paper, but they look mm -hmm. like books. Yeah. And then I decided I wanted to do something that was even more interactive. Mm -hmm. And so I made the scroll. All right. Let's and, zoom in uh, on the scroll. So this one is a piece where the viewer can come into the gallery mm -hmm. and actually pull out part of the scroll and get the scissors mm -hmm. and cut off a haiku to go. What's that haiku? This is your fortune. All right. <laughs> Intimidating her cat was named radio. Visual story. <laughs> okay. So sometimes they're... That is very random. Sometimes they're a little bit silly and sometimes they're poignant, but um, wow. let's, let's take out another one. I said, let's do another. How many, okay. how many haikus are scrolled inside of this piece of granite? That is a great question. I, I think I could more easily answer that there are hundreds and hundreds of feet of this in there. Wow. Because this was a cash register tape, okay. and I, I distressed it mm -hmm. so that it looks like the parchment paper mm -hmm. that's in the other books. And then did you so, stamp this on there, or how did you? That I did, because it's, it's a lot easier to get a long, long scroll with the text going this way yeah. than to get it then going do it the other one. way. Okay, this um, one sounds more Yeah, like this one is a little more cohesive. Thought. I guess this is a little more poetic. <laughs> this one is Windswept Parking Lot already under sand, scenes behind the wall. It's very evocative. Yeah, I mean, they're pictures with words. Mm -hmm. And um, pictures and words are two things I like very much because, wow. because I make books. Because that's what you do. Yep. So how many, you have five in this series so far? So far, and I have still several hundred more haiku poems that I haven't yet used, so this is ongoing. So what are some different, so you have this one that's a scroll, are they some different formats for the different iterations of the, the haiku books? Um, within a small range. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, they stand up mm -hmm. the way, uh, you know, any open book, book would. Mm -hmm. And some of them are not so comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they lie down, but mm -hmm. they're open. But they're beautiful because the the edges of the pages are kind of um, ruffled in a mm -hmm. way. Um, they're a little distressed, and I, I like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind if people touch them. I think don't have to wear gloves or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so. I know when we had the um, the piece in our Unconventional Mean show, that people who are visiting the gallery were sort of like, can I touch it? Can I not touch it? And I was like, well, it's granite. I mean, yeah, you can't hurt, hurt it. it in any way, <laughs> so sure, go ahead. But um, it's very interesting. That they also sort of juxtapose the masculine and the feminine because you get this huge very heavy rock. I mean, it is hollow, but it's still very heavy. And then the very delicate parchment. Yes. Or receipt I, paper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it's not, it's not that hollow. No, it, but, um, well, I, it, I saw that there's a hole in the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you have to get the angle just right to be able to get the thing to unfurl. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets kind of snagged up in there. <laughs> so, yeah. so what else are you working on right now? Or what's next? Um, I'm working on a big project, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a book project that is with the Boston Strasburg Sister City Association. Oh, wow. Um, I've done a project with them in the past, and the seed money from 
the money for this new project mm -hmm. is coming from the former project. So mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting. Um, it's a book project where there are 13 artists from America mm -hmm. and 13 artists from France all using the same resource material mm -hmm. for um, making artist books and posters. Mm -hmm. And the resource is a journal that was created by a young man who was in a French regiment who fought in the American Revolution. So it's very much intertwined between our two cities. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll have an exhibit in the fall here and next spring in Strasbourg, France, with oh, those pieces. That's very exciting. So, it is. It is. It's very exciting. So a national project. Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, more books and words. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the whole international aspect is very interesting because you're learning uh, you're learning about cultural things and how artists operate in different countries and mm -hmm. what kind of support systems they have. And are very different. Very different Europe indeed. here and vice versa, <laughs> yes. which is very interesting. Cool. Yes. And then I think you also have another show coming up that you mentioned earlier. Yes. I, in April, I'm in two shows. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the Monotype Guild show at the Attleboro Museum. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new gallery out in Lexington mm -hmm. called Blink. It's a pop-up gallery. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and they're having a printmaking show that opens April 7th. That's fantastic. And that's a new pop-up gallery in a house. Yes, yes. It's a Victorian house. Mm -hmm. It's grand and wonderful, mm -hmm. and they hang salon style. So mm -hmm. um, they have over 20 people in this show. Wow. And I dropped off 10 pieces yesterday. Wow. So, so 20, that, wow, that's a lot of work. I don't know that all of it will be up, but you Still, know, they, though, they that's, curate. Yeah. It's, it's a big house. That's it's, fantastic. Yes, yes. So during the Lexington Open Studios, actually, mm -hmm. um, they'll have the printmaking show up, and the gallery owner has her studio in the basement. There'll be printmaking demonstrations going on. Oh, fantastic. What yeah. weekend is that? I think it's mid mid April. Mid April, excellent. Yeah. And then, um, anything else? Any other ways that people can see your artwork besides seeing it at the Cambridge Art Association? <laughs> uh, my website, mm -hmm. um, which is apforbush.com. So it's a p f o r b u s h dot com. Definitely visit it. I checked it out today. It's very cool. Thank very you. clean and organized, which is <laughs> perfect for an artist website. Well, this was fun. This was a lot of fun. Um, so next month, we will be back um, on the third Wednesday with a Cambridge Open Studios preview. Julie Barry from the Cambridge Arts Council and I will be talking about Cambridge Open Studios, which is the second weekend in May. And we'll have some artist guests present to talk about what they will be featuring in Open Studios. Um, currently, you can view two shows at the Cambridge Art Association. Contemplating Landscapes is on view through April 11th at University Place Gallery. And we are also featuring Truth to Power, which is a members juried show, juried by e-viewing, and that's on view through the end of this month. Um, join us next month for Creative Process. He's our top dog. do all of New England, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I would basically let them know that you should get into um, a field that you have extensive knowledge and definitely have a good accountant. Believe it or not, our very first move was right here in Cambridge, right down the street. It was a friend of my father's. Her name was Maria, and it was an eight-hour job, and it was great. It was our first job, and, you know, we really loved it. It was pretty exciting, you know. I actually, you know, I actually, um, I went to a mass moving uh, conference last month, and there were no women there. And after talking to several business owners who've been in the industry for like, you know, more than like 50 years or more, um, they've told me that, you know, less than maybe 1% are owned by women. So it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Well, you know, just like on the trucks, is, every day is a challenge. On, you know, you're thinking about the Boston area. You're, you're trying to take a piano up three flights of stairs when it's really narrow and it barely fits. 
I mean, the movers just, they face all these things all the time. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of, um, we have to deal with all walks of life. So it's really exciting to deal with all different people over the phone and just try to accommodate them. You know, everybody has, um, has a, a question, everybody has concerns, and we just have to, you know, meet all those and answer and be, you know, very accommodating. What are some of the top Yes, because actually 90% of the people who call are actually women. So, you know, once I, I can be on the phone with them and just reassure them, like, listen, I'm a woman, I own this business, I take, you know, pride in customer service, and we will take such good care of yourself. And if you ever have a problem, I always tell them they can call me, um, you know, directly without any problems. I'm here um, six days a week.